Well ladies and gentlemen, hello again, and welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name's Graham, this is X-Plane 11 and the Torxim SR-22, the naturally aspirated version and it's part 2 of the video series. Today we're going to continue the flight from John Wayne Airport down in Orange County up towards the Grand Canyon. Cruising along at 13,000 feet, we're still at uh, full power with the mixture set according to the green band on the fuel flow meter here, just approaching the Paradise VOR. So in this video I want to hopefully demonstrate a little bit more about the engine modelling on the SR-22 and understand how we can operate both rich of peak and lean of peak with this engine and what that effect has. So first things first, we need to understand the engine controls on a piston-engined aircraft. The Cirrus is well known for having what they call a single power lever, despite the fact there's two power levers down here. You've got a single lever here, the power lever that controls the throttle and the propeller, with the mixture being separate. On a conventional aircraft you would have three levers, one for each. It's important to understand that the SR-22 doesn't have any FADEC systems on the engine. It's an entirely mechanical engine, just as you see on an old Cessna. There's a mechanical linkage inside the power lever that gives you throttle movement from idle to maximum throttle. And when you get in the top few percent of the lever movement, it also adjusts the propeller control. So normally, in the, um, the majority of the range here, the propeller will be aiming for 2500 RPM. When you've got the lever full forward, it goes for 2700 RPM, as we have at the moment. Looking at the instruments on the MFD, there's the uh, primary engine instruments up here. The percentage power is quite unique to the SR-22. This isn't something that's sensed from the engine, rather it's calculated by looking at the other parameters. Your normal instrumentation on a piston is the manifold pressure gauge, which is predominantly controlled by the throttle position, the engine RPM, which is controlled by the propeller lever, and the fuel flow, which is controlled by the mixture. On an older fixed pitch carburetor aircraft, it's normal to only have the RPM control of the RPM indication because that's really all that matters for flying a fixed pitch aircraft. But the more technically advanced an aircraft is, the more engine instrumentation you need. We've also got the cylinder head temperatures and the exhaust gas temperatures and these are quite important to understand how the engine is performing. Cylinder head temperature takes a longer time to change. The EGT responds quite quickly to mixture changes. The EGT is an indication of how the combustion is happening in the cylinders, whereas the CHT is derived from the, uh, the combustion performance, but also the cooling on the outside. So a smooth distribution on the EGT may not necessarily reflect in a smooth CHT distribution. Obviously on the uh, engine you've got cylinders at the front that are getting a lot of cooling airflow and cylinders at the rear that aren't quite getting the same cooling airflow. So it's quite normal to see the, uh, for example, the number 5 cylinder running a little bit hotter. So as I said we've leaned the mixture until it's at the top of the green band here. And just a reminder, that green band only works when we've got the power lever fully forward. This is giving us approximately best power on the aircraft. So we're doing 171 knots true. I'll just write this down as well so we can compare it later. 171 knots true. We're going to arrive, if I look at the flight plan page, we are going to arrive at uh, Grand Canyon looking at this at 11.09 and looking up here the fuel on destination is 23 gallons. Um, with most advanced X-Plane add-ons you can completely ignore this fuel remaining column here. It's just something that uh, apparently Laminar doesn't give the developers any control over. So Torxim have got fuel on destination up here. Also on the engine page we can see the uh, economy in miles per gallon we're doing 9.8 miles per gallon. So to understand how the engine's performing, we predominantly use the EGT 
because as we change the fuel flow, the EGT responds quite quickly. If I pop out the tablet here, this is a graphic that comes from the John Deacon columns on AvWeb uh, and also the Advanced Pilot Seminar website. It's based on the same content. You can see EGT, CHT, the internal cylinder pressure, the horsepower, and the uh, brake specific fuel consumption. Essentially the amount of power produced for the fuel consumed. Now at the moment, at the top of the green band on the fuel flow, we should be about 75 degrees rich of peak. We should be roughly here. Okay? But we can verify that. We can use the lean assist function. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reposition the view because I find that the keyboard shortcuts to move the mixture give fairly imprecise movements. So if I pop out the uh, PFD to keep an eye on the aircraft, pop out the MFD to actually do the leaning work, and then I move the view position so I've got the mixture zoomed in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the, push the assist button here and it gives me the delta peak value. And notice that we've got a reasonable split on the CHTs. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but at the moment the number one, uh, sorry the EGT, the number one EGT is the hottest. So you've got some cylinders running down here and some cylinders running up here. All I'm going to do is move the mixture control to the right, move it to the lean side, and uh, right with the knob or lean with the knob is also coming right on the graph here. I hope that makes sense. So keep an eye on the EGT as we move this. Move it to the right, you'll notice the fuel flow is reducing, the EGT is increasing. Now I happen to know that the peak in this configuration, at this altitude, should be around about 1500. But I'll do it nice and slowly. And you can see by zooming in to the mixture control, I get much finer control with the mouse. Speed's dropping off slightly, fuel flow is reducing, move it a little bit further. I think we're just about at the peak now. Yep, we've gone up and down the other side, so now the number two cylinder is the hottest. That means the number one has gone up and back down the other side, and the number two is closest. It's minus five, which means it's five degrees on the lean side. So if I enrich and again, I'll just push the lever, the mixture lever, towards the rich side until I get roughly minus 75. Minus 75 is the point for the best horsepower, and that's fairly common on all piston engines. You see the horsepower curve here is very flat. So I mentioned on the climb out that whilst we're aiming for the top of the green band, it's acceptable to use a little bit more fuel. It doesn't really affect the horsepower, but it will improve the cylinder head temperatures quite dramatically. You can also see that EGT changes at a higher rate than the CHT. So we're nearly there, just a tiny fraction more, I think. Minus 70, minus 75, it's close enough. We can see that by putting the mixture control at minus 70, we've got it more or less at the top of the green band, and we're still doing 9.8 miles per gallon, 170 tasks, and everything else should remain the same. If I look at the flight plan page again, 23 gallons on destination. So that's what we expect. So this is running absolutely full power. We may not necessarily want to do that. This is giving us a total range from here of 515 miles. It might be better to save a little bit of fuel for to, to ensure we've got a longer range capability. In some cases you might want to fly faster, do an intermediate stop, refuel and continue. A strong headwind, for example, flying slowly doesn't really help, but for the most part, flying a little bit slower is a lot more economical. So what I need to do is reduce the power lever setting. I'm going to aim for 2500 RPM. On the real aircraft, remember the single power lever controls both the throttle and the RPM. When the power lever is in such a position that Pushing it any further forward would increase beyond 2500 RPM. I'd feel a very slight mechanical resistance on the lever. 
we can't experience that in the sim. So rather than use 2500, if I move the lever back so that I get 2510 or 2520, then I know the lever is as far forward as possible while still being roughly 2500 RPM. You see, I can move it much further back and the RPM will stay at 25. So what I want to make sure is that I've got the most amount of power without the RPM changing too much. So 2510, 2520 is what I aim for. Now the Lean Assist functionality only works for a set manifold and RPM setting. If I move the lever at all or I change altitude, I need to reset the assist. So I'll turn it off and back on again. And what we'll do is I'll just enrich it ever so slightly and then we'll try and find our peak value. So back to the lean side. See EGTs are still rising and then dropping off again. So it looks like maybe 1470, maybe 1480 is the peak. So if I enrich again until I get minus 75, remember pushing the lever forwards or to the left on the screen is coming back down the graph here. And I'm looking for 75 on the rich side because that is the best power setting. Nearly there, just a little nudge further. May have gone too far there. So that's roughly where we want to be. Minus 75. Best power for this setting. Because this is an indication of how well the combustion is happening inside the cylinders. Fuel flow is only 14.4 gallons per hour. And everything looks fairly stable at that point. However, we've now dropped back to about 168 knots. It is increasing ever so slightly, but let's say 168 knots true. If I go back to my flight plan, it's now saying 11, uh, 11. So that's cost me two minutes. My fuel on destination has gone to 27.28. So that's about five gallons we've saved. And if I go back on here, my fuel economy is now 11.7 nautical miles per gallon. I've got about an extra half hour of endurance by doing that. But most importantly, I've saved myself five gallons of fuel over essentially one hour and 40 minutes flight time. Now in the UK, aviation gasoline can be, depending on the exchange rate, in the region of 15 to $18 per gallon. So saving five gallons easily pays for lunch at the airfield and half the fuel for coming home at US prices. So 2500 RPM, 70, 75 degrees, rich of peak, and we're still motoring along at more or less the same speed, a couple of knots difference, no more than that. What I want to do is try and get the aircraft over to the lean of peak side. I'm looking for that best fuel economy at around about 50 degrees lean of peak. Now an important concept here is that of the EGT spread. So remember that the EGT is really the, uh, the performance of the combustion inside the cylinders. It's a direct reflection of the fuel-air mix inside the cylinders. This engine is fuel injected, so each of the injectors can be balanced. Can be, uh, you can have calibrated injectors fitted to make sure that the EGTs are roughly the same where you want them to be. You can get your EGTs quite tightly clustered. If you imagine that, uh, well at the moment we've got what, over 60 degrees split, so there's uh, basically this much split in the EGT. On the rich side, that's a fairly flat power band, so the cylinders at the front of the engine are producing roughly the same power as the cylinders at the rear of the engine. But if I had that same split, that uh, 50 or 60 degree split, I would have a huge difference on the lean side. The engine would run very rough because one of the cylinders would be putting out a, a lot more power than the other cylinders so you get basically stress along the engine crank which is not ideal. That's where rough running comes from. And with a carburetor engine where there's a single point of fuel delivery it's very difficult to get the fuel-air mixture in each of the cylinders to be 
anywhere close to perfect. So carburetor engines, as a general rule, cannot run lean of peak. There's always exceptions, but as a general rule, a fuel injected aircraft can run lean of peak. Carburetor engines would struggle to run lean of peak, unless you're really, really fortunate. So to move over to lean of peak, it's very straightforward. I've already got the assist function on. I haven't changed the power setting. All I'm going to do is pull the mixture lever towards the lean side. So right on the screen, right on the graph, up over the top and back down the other side. So still approaching the top here. Just approaching the peak now. And as we get over the other side, it will change fairly rapidly. So if you go too far, you'll get substantially uh, less power and rough running quite quickly. You can see that horsepower curve drops off very quickly. Leaning an aircraft is very poorly taught at PPL training. And that's generally because you've got an older, lower performance aircraft operating at reasonably low altitudes and the mixture control is simply used to turn the engine off at the end of the day. Um, if you're only operating two or 3,000 feet above your airfield elevation in an aircraft that cruises at 90 knots, then there's not much difference with the mixture. And most training aircraft, or certainly the training aircraft I trained on, didn't have this level of instrumentation. So it's fairly difficult to get a, a reasonable leaning out of them. If you only have a fixed pitch propeller, you can lean for maximum RPM. That's equivalent to obviously maximum horsepower. And if your CHT is increased, just push the mixture lever forward a little bit. Head straight forward. So there we are, minus 45, minus 50, minus 55. I'll just give it a minute or two for the speed to settle down. But while that's happening, we can see the fuel flow has dropped off quite dramatically. At the moment, I've got another hour of endurance. That's made a huge difference to the fuel burn. So if I look at my flight plan, actually we're going to end up, let's say about 150, let's say 157, just to give it a little bit of uh, leeway here. We're now saying 1115. So that's a grand total of six minutes compared to the full power setting. Our fuel on destination is 32 gallons. And our fuel consumption is 13.8 miles per gallon. So simply by moving this lever here and this lever here and understanding this gauge, we've managed to save ourselves nine gallons of fuel. Now, at UK prices, that could be a couple of hundred dollars easily, simply by moving the lever. The difference in speed is about 14 knots or so. But our fuel economy has gone from just under 10 to just under 14. A 40% improvement in the fuel economy on the aircraft. So if you're operating at high altitude, or higher altitudes, and you want to get the best range out of the aircraft, then you need to understand how to lean the mixture. Key learning points are the assist function is very useful, but it only works after you've set the RPM and the manifold. So move your power lever where you want it, then turn the assist function on, and then you're good to go. You can run rich of peak and lean of peak. And you don't have to always do it the same power setting. There's other power settings in the manual. I find 25, 10, 25, 20, lean of peak. It's fast enough and I get a good range out of it. It works for what I want in the simulator. So two other considerations. At the moment, we're running with the fuel boost pump selected on. My fuel tanks are nicely balanced and Cirrus recommend running the boost pump for at least the first uh, half hour of the cruise flight. It's to do with vapor suppression in the fuel system and we'll look at the fuel system during some uh, starting problems we'll look at in video 4. But at this point we don't really need the fuel pump anymore. I'm happy we can try turning the fuel pump off. That's going to change the fuel pressure. As a result it's going to change the fuel flow. So at the moment I'm running on the lean side. 
If I reduce the fuel flow even more, I'm going to slide down to the right here, the horsepower is going to drop off. In fact, I could get to the point where I get a lean cut, there's not enough fuel going into the engine to keep it running. So all I'm going to do is remember this figure here, 11.3. I'm going to enrich in the mixture by about a gallon per hour, 12.1. I'll turn the boost pump off and then we'll reset. Oh, there we go, spot on, 11.3. So it's as simple as that. The fuel flow is a function of the pressure on the fuel rail, uh, the fuel uh, metering valve and the mixture position. So if we have to turn that pump on now before a tank change, all it's going to do is move us temporarily closer to the uh, peak EGT. But at 50% power, we're not going to do any harm whatsoever. On a similar concept, let me just change the view here. On a similar concept, we're at 13,000 feet. And so far, we've been changing the mixture distribution, the mixture in the cylinders, by adjusting the fuel flow. I reduce the amount of fuel and the mixture gets lean. The same effect occurs if I increase the amount of air. So if I start descending without adjusting anything else, uh, again, I'm going to get leaner and leaner and leaner until we get to the point where the engine's not making any power. So for me, personally, lean of peak in this aircraft is acceptable for the cruise, but I want to go back to rich of peak prior to starting the descent. That way, if I'm rich of peak and I descend and I forget about the mixture for a little bit too long, it still leans, but it goes from here up to here, and we still have horsepower, as opposed to from here down to here, and things start to get exciting quickly. As always, keep an eye on the CHTs on the aircraft. Make a note of which fuel flow settings work for you, your regular cruise altitudes, and then you don't have to go through the whole uh, lean assist feature. But to be honest, it adds a fair bit of operational interest and it helps us understand how the combustion is happening inside the cylinders. In the next video, we'll do the approach and landing into Grand Canyon Airport. But looking at my flight plan, that's still uh, an hour and 30 minutes away. I hope you'll tune in for that video. Thanks very much for watching. If you do have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I do hope you're enjoying the SR22 series. Still focusing on the natural aspirated version for the next couple of videos, and then we'll move on to the turbo normalized aircraft and look at the difference on that, because the key part of the SR22 simulation is the engine modeling. You essentially get two models in the single package. Again, thanks for watching and I hope you'll tune in again soon.